Hello class, this is Marcella. So this is your first uh, recorded lecture and we're going to be talking about some background information on how plants grow, how, um, I guess, how they interact, what their limitations is, and how we can use this in classification. So communities, um, there used to be this idea, this historic idea of the superorganism. And um, Clements was really this big proponent that um, all individuals within a community are inter interdependent. And this idea of the superorganism still influences how we um, kind of think about communities, think about forest classification, and really um, think about, um, I guess, ecology. Uh, Gleason, on the other hand, um, really promoted this idea of gradients, that moisture, temperature, and these other gradients really influence composition. And this, this discussion was going on in the 1920s. And while we, still, while we see that individual species, that species respond as individuals, not as superorganisms like Gleason hypothesized, these, these ideas of Clements and Gleason are still very um, apparent in how, how we classify forest systems. So when we think about a community, when we think about an individual, we have to be thinking about both the positive and negative interactions that influence plants. And we can think of this as competition and facilitation. So competition is that negative interactions, whereas facilitation is that positive interaction. And I think this um, figure is pretty funny. Um, so we have different species, so interspecies competition. And this picture is showing them competing for light. And um, different species have different levels of ability to compete for light. So um, in this one, this guy who's running, um, it looks like some kind of conifer species, may be a better competitor than this broadleaf species when we think about competing for light. And those competition, competition is those negative interactions where whoever is the best competitor for light may win, whereas facilitation is positive interactions. And this figure turned out a little grainy, I'm sorry about that. So in this case, we see this larger plant, uh, maybe a shrub, is facilitating this smaller plant. So this may be in a very arid ecosystem. So this larger plant may be providing shade, may be providing um, very shade, which would decrease the amount of transpiration and respiration needed uh, by this plant. So it may be allowing this plant to grow better uh, by ameliorating the environment, whereas out here, this guy is just, he has all the environmental stressors. So we think of these competition and facilitation as both negative and positive interactions. And really the main point here is this idea that plants are influenced by both negative and positive interactions. And that influences who's in your forest, who's in your uh, community, who's in your ecosystem. And when we think of individuals, we can think of them at these different, this different levels, just like uh, on the first day of class, we talked about this idea of the stand and the forest and the landscape. Well, when we're thinking about all these different levels, it helps to be able to classify them. So we can think about them as zones of vegetation. And this is probably a figure uh, some of you have seen before. And these are the different zones of vegetation within North America. And right now in Minnesota uh, and the Lake States, we're kind of on this, um, we're mostly in that green, in that temperate continental forest. There's also probably a little bit of that temperate, uh, ooh, it's a little hard to see, uh, in that yellow one. So we can see that there's difference between um, these forest systems and they're really these broad broad kind of classification we can think of these as landscape classifications um, so these zones of vegetation 
these are not the distribution is not random um, and there's there's some randomness to them but there's this underlying suite of environmental conditions that will support growth and um, this is often considered the niche so the niche is kind of the niche or niche um, depending on who uh, who uh, you're talking to but this niche is kind of this all-encompassing um, matrix of environmental conditions that will support growth and these niches create these patterns that we're able to see on the landscape and have allowed a lot of scientists to classify this and we'll be going through an exercise looking at um, one of the classification systems in Minnesota um, very shortly. So the niche, um, we often think of the niche, we can define the niche as both the fundamental and realized niche. So the fundamental niche is this encompassing, this matrix, this gradient uh, of conditions that an individual species can grow on. So it's this all-encompassing um, environment that a species can grow as. That's the fundamental niche. Whereas the realized niche is often considered smaller than the fundamental niche, and that's when uh, other aspects such as competition plays a role. And we can look at this example. So this is straight out of, um, um, this is from an example from Oliver and Larson, um, the um, other book that was um, not required but maybe recommended. So this is an example from there. And we see two species, and these are two southern species. So we have tulip poplar and Virginia pine. And one of the first things that we see, well, when they're growing, growing alone, we see, okay, tulip poplar um, doesn't do that great on these droughty soils, does really well on these moist, well-drained soils. Where Virginia pine ah, does okay on droughty soils, and does a little bit better on moist, well-drained soil. So what we're seeing here is that the moist, well-drained soils support better growth for the tulip poplar and the Virginia pine, right? Both of these tree species are growing better on, on these moist, well-drained soils. However, when, when they're growing together, they're competing. So we can see um, this relationship of how these two are growing um, separate, but when they grow together we see, well, the tulip poplar is going to outcompete the Virginia pine on this moist, well-drained soil because it grows better than that. But on that droughty soil, the Virginia pine is going to grow better than the tulip poplar. So we can see that the Virginia pine is often found on droughty soils, not because it wants to be found on droughty soils, but that's where it competes better. So when you're walking, when you're looking at the landscape, um, often where a species is found, it may not be where it wants to be. It may not be the best place. So when we think about it, so Virginia pine, we see it on droughty soils, but it really wants to be on these moist, well-drained soils. But it has certain adaptations that allow it to be a better competitor on droughty soils compared to the tulip poplar. Um, so just as we think about this, there's this idea, this is going to come into play when we talk about um, where species are, um, how, how we use different silvicultural systems in promoting different species. So um, there's the idea not only of the fundamental niche, so Virginia pine can grow on both droughty and moist, well-drained soils, but its realized niche is really these droughty soils because it's outcompeted on the moist, well-drained soils. So we often have to we also have to think about it. It's more than just a niche. So um, there's all kinds of areas where tree species can grow. So individual species, especially trees, can have these huge, wide uh, geographic distributions. And this is an example of eastern hemlock. So eastern hemlock, uh, as you can see, um, kind of reaches its range margin right on that Minnesota-Wisconsin border. And there's some thought that the reason why it's not in Minnesota, it just hasn't, it, it's still migrating. So there's the idea that, you know, maybe if we gave it a few hundred thousand years, it would be in Minnesota. 
So this idea of how glaciers influence eastern hemlocks distribution is playing out right now. We also have to think it's not only the geographic barriers. So geographic, we can talk about glaciers, we can talk about seed source, we can talk about all these things. So that can influence where a species is. We can also talk about the biotic. So eastern hemlock has a, a few things that are kind of might be influencing uh, where it's at <laughs> that include herbivory uh, and disturbance. So when we think about eastern hemlock, we think deer. Deer are our main, one of the, deer, pref, deer love eastern hemlock. They just love to mow it down. And in some of these areas, we have very high deer pressure. Another thing is the hemlock woolly adulgent. So that's gonna influence, influence where the species is and where it can compete. That's more than just those kind of, um, just that kind of abiotic when we think of the niche, where it competes well. Well, it's how it competes, it's being influenced by all these other biotic interactions. And then of course, there's just random chance. So um, that chance that uh, one of these species hung around, um, isn't eaten by a deer, there's all these things that influence the distribution of tree species. So it's important when we think about it, we think about the abiotic. What's the climate like? What is the species adapted to? But we also have to think about the other, um, other factors that are influencing. Um, are there any other, as you kind of sit here and think, what else might influence a tree species distribution? What else can um, really impact where you see something or where you don't see something. So what next topic we're going to move into tree growth. So what do trees need to grow? I'm going to give you a second and as you're watching this at home, I want you to write down a few ideas. Okay, so at the very basic, what trees need to do, they need, they need photosynthesis and they need respiration. And I have these equations on here, um, not because I'm going to ask you to write photosynthesis and respiration, but really to kind of remind you at the very heart of this what we're, what we're getting at, that trees take uh, carbon dioxide and water and sunlight and create on these sugars and oxygen, and they use this sugars and oxygen to create energy for the plant, right? So when we think about photosynthesis, we're thinking about this production of organic sugars and oxygen. And throughout the next few slides, there's a lot of these cute little diagrams to kind of get at this idea of how light and energy and carbon dioxide are coming together to produce these sugars. And these sugars is really what builds our, builds our trees, builds our plants. So um, uses, so it uses carbon dioxide from the oxygen, or from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, water from the soil, energy from the sun. So then we have respiration, and sugars, respiration is that conversion, the ability for sugars to be converted to energy for respiration. And these sugars are converted and used. So these are the sugars that are used for the structure, growth, and survival. Um, also for resistance to insects and diseases. So this section is really just this basic background of some of the tree physiology of how trees grow, what they need, what you have to be thinking about. So again, another picture of respiration and photosynthesis. And this is kind of, I like, I figured I'd show a few different pictures and hopefully one of them uh, you respond to more, catches your eye, and you can kind of bring back um, all those biology courses um, that you had in the past to kind of remember these key, key components of how um, trees um, grow. So what do trees need to grow? So that comes down to sunlight, 
water, mineral nutrients, suitable temperatures, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. So these are the really foundational aspects of what trees need to grow. Um, so sunlight, how much or how little? And that's really species dependent. And one thing we're gonna really talk about throughout this course is this tolerance, this tolerance level, and that's gonna influence how we manage our systems. So one of the backgrounds, why, why we're going over this is because to understand how to use silvicultural tools, to understand how to manage our forest, we have to understand the individual. And this is kind of that foundation. This is kind of the first step of what, what a species is. So uh, sunlight, so this is really species dependent. And we can classify this as shade tolerant or shade intolerant. And shade tolerant is the ability to survive at lower light intensities. Whereas shade intolerance, you need more light to survive. And we can think about these, this is one example of two different plants. And we can see the shade tolerant plant needs a lower level. It peaks at a lower level of, um, of um, sunlight, it peaks. And whereas the sun plant uh, peaks at a higher level. So this, this idea of whether you're shade tolerant and shade intolerant really influences how, how these species survive. So when we think about it, um, so a shade tolerant plant, um, do you think that species would be able to survive in the understory? So if we're, if we're looking around on campus, if we're looking through the forest, those species that we see in the understory, those small um, plants that are seedlings or saplings, what would your guess? Would you guess they would be shade tolerant or shade intolerant, especially if they have an overstory above them? Most likely they would be shade tolerant. So some examples of shade tolerant individuals include sugar maple. Um, more shade intolerant species could include aspen or willow. Um, so this is kind of one example that talks about shade tolerance and also a little bit about disturbance. So we'll be getting into these different disturbances later. Um, but really I wanted to get at this idea of how, disturb, how these species kind of interact. So we, if we have this species right here is jack pine, so that taller pine species, that's our jack pine. Um, and this is black spruce. So we have this idea that we have a species, we have two species together, right? And depending on how the disturbance is going to influence. So if we have a high intensity fire, so that's going to take everything out. So we're left with a very bare environment, a very, um, a very open environment, which would be promoted by species that are shade intolerant. So that can really take advantage of that sunlight and grow. Whereas, um, maybe in a situation where there's less um, less disturbance, so no fire, just a blow down, maybe we'd be promoting more of the shade uh, tolerant individuals. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna continually talk about this, but I kinda wanted to give you a kinda sneak peek that the shade tolerance is really important when we talk about how individuals in the community um, are influenced by one another. So this is kind of something that should be um, kind of, as you're thinking about it, kind of continually thinking about shade tolerance in relationship to other stuff. So shade intolerant needs a lot of sun. They're not able to be tolerant of shade. Shade tolerant, they're tolerant of lower levels of sunlight. So all, all, all plants need sun. It's just what level of sunlight do they prefer? Or do they, or can they take advantage of? Water is another key key <laughs> part of what allows plants to grow. So, um, in the lake states in Minnesota, we see we see thousands and thousands of lakes all around us, and that's great for plants because it a lot of times there's a lot of water. So um, we can think of water in kind of a few different ways. So we have 
um, kind of saturation um, and capillary water. So first, let's talk about capillary water is um, water in small pores and uh, surrounding individual soil particles. So we think the soil and the soil holds our water, right? The soil gives us, the soil allows plants to hold the water. So when we think of saturation, so that's when all the pores are full of water and the water is easily lost. So think of like a sponge, if we think of sponge. So when you soak that sponge so much, it's kind of dripping. So think that's when it's saturated. Whereas when it's at field capacity, that's where, um, if you think of the um, tree as uh, kind of the roots infiltrating these uh, soil particles and trying to get at, that's where the when it's at field capacity, this water is available for plant growth. So the trees, the roots are able to suck this water out. Whereas at wilting point, that's when there's not a water available to plants. There may be water really tightly clung to these soil particles, but it's not available for the plants to take up. Um, so again, if we think about that sponge, there's that, there's that point where, okay, I've wrung this sponge out so much but it's still wet. Well, we can think of those, so those water particles are so tightly held to that sponge, you can tell there's water in there, but you can't get it out. So that's kind of similar to uh, this wilting point idea that sometimes there's water and it's so tightly clung to the soil that the roots can't get it out. And water really influences, <laughs> I mean, tree growth. We can see uh, where there's lots of water, we get trees that grow. That grow. So when we think of the southeast or uh, the northwest, these places have lots of water. Even around us in the lake states, we have lots of water. We're not limited by water. Whereas when we think about the desert, those plants are small. They're really limited by water. So how does water move in a tree? So water moves in a hardwood. It moves upward in um, the uh, vessels, in the xylem. So upward movement of um, water in the vessel. So it comes up from the roots and we're moving through this xylem. And so this is a really nice kind of schematic diagram of a tree. And then we have the phloem. And the phloem is where um, the sugars move. and. Um, how I remember the difference between that xylem moves water, phloem moves food. So phloem, food, um, they sound similar. So we see that there's differences in how, where, where this stuff is moving and how it's moving. So vessels are in hardwoods and conifers had tracheads. So they're slightly different, and this is really, again, this is all a lot of background information to kind of um, kind of jog your memory on some of this stuff. So conifers have tracheids. They're generally narrower in diameter and have a slower rate of transport. Whereas hardwoods have vessels, they're wider in diameter and have a faster rate of transport. Um, take a second. Think of how this ability to transport water may influence where you find uh, an individual species. So where, which species would you think uh, would do better where, um, on a mesic site? So not too wet, not too dry, but just a good amount of water. Um, and I'm going to ask you about that question on Tuesday morning. So. Um, just think about which species. Um, this is not, um, this is kind of one of those low, um, low impact things. So you're not gonna, you're gonna get points if you try. So I'm gonna, Tuesday morning, we're gonna talk about this. I'm gonna ask, hey, what do you think? And you'll have about a minute to write it down. And I want a reason. So um, kind of think about why why conifers and tracheids and hardwoods and vessels might be different. So water, again, we have, we've been talking about this water, so this is 
these slides are really designed to kind of show different kind of figures, different schematics to kind of jog your memory on this. So we have capillary action in the roots and transpiration through the stomata. So this is really how we're uh, pulling water up through this plant. And as water is used, it becomes more and, that should be and, more and more uh, attracted to the soil particles. So as the water is used, um, we see that transition from available water to wilting point. So we see that transition, the water becomes more and more attracted to the soil particles and becomes more difficult. So that's where we need um, kind of our recharge, we need precipitation. Then we have nutrients. Uh, nutrients are elements that are taken up uh, by the tree in a few organic mo molecular forms. And these nutrients, we think of them, they're concentrated in the leaves, the phloem, phloem, which is inside the bark. Um, kind of, if you forget what that is, kind of scroll back um, to the slide and kind of see that schematic of the tree um, with the phloem and the xylem. We, you have your buds, your root tips, and your flowers. So these are really the big uh, players when we talk about uh, nutrients. Uh, we have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, um, and those are really those building blocks. We see um, we see that in those um, in the photosynthesis and respiration uh, equations. And then we have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And anyone who's done a little bit of garden um, kind of know these as NPK. And these are often what you have to add to your add to your gardens to. Um, kind of when you want to get a bigger, bigger fruits, bigger veggies, so NPK. And then you have these other, other ones. We have sulfur, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. And then we have these minor nutrients, and these are considered trace elements. But these trace elements can, are extremely important um, when we talk about growth. So nutrients. Um, we're just going to focus on one of them, nitrogen. And this is often thought to be a limiting nutrient. And it's used in higher concentrations than other nutrients and is often absorbed from the soils. Some, some, some uh, plants have this ability to form associations with nitrogen-fixing microorganisms. And they can fix them, actually, from the atmosphere. And a few of those examples are alders and legumes. So this is kind of one of those schematics. So we see uh, nitrogen is in the air, and the microbes actually fix these in nodules on the roots of um, the plant or the crop. And they're able to give those back um, to the plant. So that gives those plants an advantage. So nutrients. Um, so there's a gradient of availability. And again, here's, here's an example when we think of conifers versus hardwoods. So conifers, the roots tend, these are generalities, so roots tend to be a little bit larger, and this is, advantage, this is an advantage extracting nutrients from primary minerals, so less well-developed soils. Whereas hardwoods have small, more numerous fine roots, more surface area and from organic matter in well-developed soil. So again, these are just kind of generalities, kind of thinking, okay, car conifers are able to extract uh, nutrients from uh, less well-developed soils, whereas hardwoods might be doing better in more uh, developed soils. And temperature is another important one. We're just, this is kind of just a really brief kind of broad thing, and that temperature really drives the ability for these reactions, these enzymes um, that are kind of going on within the plant. And we see, um, this is just a broad one, that there's kind of this optimum right around 40 degrees C, um, and we see how um, the, how temperature influences what's going on in the plant. So too hot, it's not great. Too cold, you're not able to be active. Oxygen. Oxygen is all around us, um, and it's absorbed through bark, lenticels, leaves, buds, and roots. Um, however, sometimes 
even though it's all around us and we're breathing it in, trees can be limited by oxygen. And they're limited sometimes when there's too much moisture. So when there's standing water, this limits oxygen to the roots and the roots basically suffocate. So there's some species that are adapted to uh, these moist conditions. And we think of the south, we think of these bottomland species. We think of um, even up here, we think of those uh, river species and these um, um, kind of swampy species. So bald cypress pumps oxygen to the roots from the stem. So um, we think of this idea the cypress garden's porous trunks tissues allow more oxygen into cypress trees when their roots are submerged under standing water. And we can kind of see, um, we can see this that when, this is a dry site right now, we see those roots and <laughs> sometimes they're under standing water and the trunk is able to kind of support these roots. Um, other species like Black spruce develop advantageous advantage, develop specialized roots from their stem. So there's all these different kind of adaptations to deal with the conditions where these trees grow, and we'll we'll kind of talk about this more later. And then finally, we have carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, and um, this is limited when the stomata, so how the plant takes in CO2 and um, respires water and oxygen. So this is really limited when it's closed to reduce water loss. Um, so this may happen during the middle of day. Um, and again, remember back to those biology, remember back to these previous courses where this will, if you don't have carbon dioxide, you're not able to do photosynthesis. So this really influences how and when plants are photosynthesizing and thus producing sugars.